Hey, I'm Kristen Lee, a.k.a. Lethal Exposure, here at the new Beverly Cinema, checking out the private screening of the new forthcoming feature documentary, Inside Metal, the pioneers of Los Angeles hard rock and metal. Did you enjoy the flick? Did you? Uh... That was awesome. Bob did a great job. Um, I think there's something that everybody can actually watch this movie and learn something they probably weren't aware about, with all the interaction from the older mans and what have you. Right. Great. He did a great job. No, I agree. I agree. And uh, did you uh, kind of take? Did it kind of take you back, like back in time? You know, watching that. Like, did it kind of make you feel like you were still there? You know. Hundred percent. And there's a lot of these guys in the movie that, you know. We all played the same clubs at the same times, back and forth, and so-and-so's over here, and so-and-so's over here. And to see all these guys have the careers that they did, it, it's, it's just impressive. Excellent. Okay, so how did you uh, enjoy the uh, documentary? Did you like it? It was like a college course in music history. I loved it. Uh, I loved all the details. of. There's so many little details of how everything came to be. Right, right. Okay. And uh, do you think this documentary will help reach out to kids these days, you know, and maybe like introduce the scene and, and kind of inspire them to listen again to metal and, and hard rock? Yeah, I do. There's so much to, to take in. And history always repeats itself, and um, it's, it's interesting seeing how things started and th how like one door would close and then another door opened, so to speak. Definitely. How do you feel about the documentary? Did you enjoy it? I did. I did. It was. Uh, I, I kind of want to make a playlist. There's a bunch of bands that I um, like always meant to listen to, and bands that were like influencing some of my favorite bands, and I'm like, I need to check them out. So it was uh, uh, really informative, like especially if you love metal and music and. Um, and if you play music, it's just like, uh, it's good to know your roots and everything. So Definitely. I absolutely agree with you. Do you think that um, this documentary will definitely reach out to, to kids, you know, today and uh, inspire them to listen to old school rock and metal? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the, uh, the great thing about metalheads and rock fans, uh, um, they respect, uh, you know, their roots. And I think they will... Like myself, go and like dig some some of these bands that I've never even heard of that, you know, uh, great artists are citing as influences. Um, you know, just like uh, I, I went back and like looked up all the new wave of British heavy metal artists and you know, hearing stuff like that. And then now it's there's this whole other uh, uh, well of like untapped bands for myself to listen to. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited. Awesome. Yeah. Well, for me, it was very informative simply because, you know, I moved to L.A. in 1982, but a lot of friends of mine were coming out here and being in the scene and telling me, hey, we got a job for you out here, come on out. And, you know, during the years of 75 and through 81, which is a lot of what this is all about, is all the stuff that I missed out on. But I had heard the stories of, you know, and they said, well, come on out, you know, and be a part of it. And I wasn't able to make it out till 82. So for me, it was really, really like a, a firsthand lesson to hear what was going on out here which you know it's uh it's uh really really informative you know like i said very very uh, it's like I, I i got an education by uh by seeing the documentary really well done by bob so and speaking of education you know do you think that it's important for uh kids these days to you know learn the history of hard rock and metal do you think that it might inspire them to listen to it more you know these days and you know this especially this documentary do you think that it would help you know pull them in a little more to appreciate it well yeah absolutely simply because you know there's no music programs in schools anymore you know so and to play this kind of music you have to be a musician so you know it, yeah for sure that it, this is the way that it, that it was before also too that you know you really had to pay your dues before you went anywhere you had to work in the clubs night after night after night it's not like American Idol where they just throw you on a stage or you go to some karaoke night and you think you're the greatest singer in the world you know you really gotta you gotta hone your chops basically in music speak and uh, this is basically what all these bands had to do and you know it's kind of sad the fact that we live in LA and you know original bands can't play their music for a living like they used to do like 
like back then. So? My name is Greg Leon from the Greg Leon Invasion, formerly Dawkins, played with Tommy Lee in Sweet 19, Gary Holland in Sweet 19, and uh, played or knew everybody back in the day, had a lot of good times, a lot of good memories, and uh, it was really fun being here tonight, uh, to or today, and reliving these, and uh, a lot of good memories, running into a lot of old friends, so it's been really cool. Yeah, it's like a big reunion almost, it's, right? It's like a rock and roll class reunion. Yeah, I was going to say, too, uh, did it kind of make you like feel like you were back in those days again watching the documentary? Well, yeah, I mean... Did it take you back in time? It does take you back in time. I and mean, you remember how fun it was and how fresh it was and how everybody had so much hope and dreams of really getting out there and basically taking over the world the way Van Halen did or, you know, whoever. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it brings back a lot of memories. Now, how did you feel about the documentary? Like, uh, what was your favorite scene? Or, you know, was there a certain scene that really, like, pulled you in and, you know... Yeah. Any scene that I was in. Is, <laughs> <laughs> no. The whole thing, I mean, you're just hanging on every word because everybody except like two people I knew or have had dealings with or was in a band with, so it was, you know, and you know, people saying things, oh, wow, I forgot about that, that's right, you know, and then they're showing pictures of all the old clubs where we used to play all the time, and yeah, it was, it was uh, I wouldn't want to miss, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. That's awesome. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much for coming. First of all, Bob Nalbanjan has been the heart and soul of not only preserving but also giving rep recognition to all the people that struggled and paid their dues in this particular era, you know, the 70s and 80s of the metal scene. And now he, 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 did the, he, did, he directed it, he produced this documentary, and he also did the voiceover, which I was very impressed because I do a little voiceover myself on a couple of national networks for, like, fight commentary. But, man, it was so amazing. All the stories being told about Van Halen, Motley Crue, and all my heroes, all my friends, and getting to see so many people here at the thing, it's, it's really good that he's shedding light and that this is shedding light on a great era in rock and roll history. Right. No, I absolutely agree. And it's almost kind of like a reunion right now, right, for you? Yeah, you feel yeah, like, yeah. hey, yeah. you know, you, you see all these people you haven't seen forever. Um, now, did um, did anything in, this, in the documentary kind of hit at home for you? Like, was there anything where a, cer a certain scene where you're like, oh, wow, you know, that really hits you, like, hard? To give you, like, a certain vibe, you know what I mean? Well, I think one of the things was the diverse opinions that were being given on certain subjects. Some people said, oh, yeah, everybody got along and all the different musical styles meshed, but other people said, no, there was a division between punk and hard rock and things like that. So I, I think what it was is that it was like a freedom of speech, but there were a lot of truths coming through on this thing. A lot of stories where people always wondered what the answer was to the Eddie Van Halen genius or to the different things that were going on. And I, I think that it just showed a lot of heart and, and you could really feel the dues that were paid by every individual that was showcased. That's awesome. And hey, i uh, just curious, uh, what was it like working with Bob, the, the producer? Uh, well, Bob was pretty much like, I mean, at the risk of sounding like I'm shilling, <laughs> it was like the dream producer because, see, understand, Bob loves this. So when someone loves something that you also love, you have that thing in common. I mean, this is where why you know men and women get married. Oh, you like stock car racing, so do I. But you know, I, I think it was a situation where I hope that this is just the beginning for Bob Nalbanjian as a filmmaker. How did you like the documentary? I think it was absolutely wonderful. I mean, what an undertaking to put all that history together. I think the producers of the movie should go for a, doc a doctorate in musical history. They need not write another thesis. That film is it. Undeniably, they have captured that era. Yeah. It's a wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Good. And do you think that it's going to um, inspire kids that, you know, watch, if the kids that watch this uh, documentary, do you think it's going to inspire them to listen to, you know, metal and, and, and to, like, go back I, to that I era? It's going to, I think, I think it'll influence them to, like, not pass it by to go, oh, what's this? This seemed like it was pretty cool. Yeah, give them respect. And what we're really hoping for is for them to come up with something and get that energy rolling again. We hadn't seen that kind of energy since the mid-60s in San Francisco. All that stuff going on, and it was nowhere near documented as well as this movie has done. So what's really cool comes around again, this could be the spark plug that ignites it. I, I think the guys did a fantastic job with that. I enjoyed every minute of it. That's great. And also, um, what do you think about the way they betrayed the L.A. scene? Like, do you think that they really um, explained that, you know, 
exactly how it used to be and do you think that they really pinpointed all the details and, and and if so like what do you think has changed since then well I think it's it's very very neat the way that they have described that they've really done their homework on that you couldn't do that from the outside you had to be really deeply involved you had to be in the water you couldn't look down from the pier and describe it this is done from within the water they got down there and yeah that's good what did you think about the documentary? It's been a long time coming. It was uh, just a brilliant piece of film and friends that I got to see on there. I'm so proud of Bob and Joe and everybody for actually doing this for, uh, for, for everybody to see where it actually, where everything really started. You know, how we learned from, you know, those amazing musicians that actually didn't, it wasn't that they weren't good enough, and I saw that in the film. They were brilliant. I mean, all of us that made it and did our thing in the 80s, you know, in the later 80s, and be became what we became, it was all because of these guys. And it was be it was just so wonderful for me to see that it was finally put on, and all these stories that we all tell each other throughout all these years, that it's finally put up there, and people can actually see that it's 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 true, and it's all true. Right, right. That's that is true, and it's awesome that you got to experience that. I, you well, know, I, I was very, you know, I was like maybe about 15, 16 years old, trying to get into the Starwood when these guys were playing. So I was getting kicked out and everything, but of, of those clubs. But I was able to sneak into different places and get to see them when I was, you know, really young, coming from Monterey Park and taking a bus or hitching a ride, you know, just so I could see what, you know, these guys were doing and creating this, these legendary performances that we would hear in Pasadena, in Montebello, in South Bay, and everywhere else. So we all kind of try to congregate into Hollywood to see, you know, what was really happening. And I just got to say it, man, there's a lot of music that come from a lot of different places, but L.A. started it, man, basically. And, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely proud to be in a person that was from L.A. because of yes. that, too, because there's a Born lot of history raised. here. You too? Born and raised. Yes. That's awesome. That's yes, awesome. a High true five. native. <laughs> yes, Great. absolutely. Okay, and now how uh, much do you think the L.A. scene has changed since then? Do you think it's, uh, you know, he, there's a huge dramatic... Dramatically. Everything's, of course, everything's changes in, in life, but, you know, I wish that some of these new bands up and coming here in Los Angeles especially are, will be able to see this and to get charged with energy and to, to see maybe that they do maybe have to be a little bit more competitive like those cats were and to take that time and to really make your thing special and I think that's really important for young musicians to when they see this movie to say like to get that out of it like wow even as hard as they work they still didn't achieve what they wanted to but it was still greatness you know and it still had that time and we're playing we're paying um, this movie is paying homage to that and that is just brilliant fabulous wonderful that's awesome. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. I really appreciate your time. Thank well, you anytime. so much. Thank you so much. Take Thank, care. God bless. Yeah. Thank you. This has been a great, great show. I just loved it. It was he. Bob has gone out of his way to put this together, and uh, uh, of course, it's kind of funny to watch all of us that were involved with it, whatever we remember of it, of course. Uh, and all of us have gotten a little older over the years. Maybe gained a couple of pounds or two or something like that, but. I'm, I'm just so glad that he's he's uh, put it all together, and I'll, and I'll be glad when it comes out because then I can. I, my daughter was with me tonight, and she's just she knew she's seen the pictures with the long hair and all that kind of stuff, and and but to see it be part of reality like that is really. My son couldn't make it, but but she's just going, oh my god, dad, oh did you did you really do that? I said whatever the, whatever anybody tells you. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. I wasn't there. I don't remember a damn thing. But uh, but yeah, I, I'm so glad that Bob did this and the rest of it. Like what what pulled you in and made you feel at home? Well, uh, my drummer, uh, my current drummer, is actually in the movie as well, John Hyde, and he had some uh, amazing stories to tell, especially uh, uh, about his uh, being able to play on John Bonham's drums actually with Led, uh, with Led Zeppelin. That was that was an amazing story. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we have a band right now called the Funkin' Maniacs. Uh, Detective was mentioned in the in the movie. Uh, that's the name of, of their band. So I have the bass player and the drummer from Detective. And I'm from Legs Diamond, so it's like cops and robbers. Nice. Okay. Now, where can uh, we find you if we uh, want to? Uh, we're, uh, we're on Facebook. The name of the band's the Funkin' Maniacs. Okay, Funkin'. Funkin'. F-U-N-K. Yes, yes ma'am. <laughs> okay, got it. And now, um, I know that you know you've been around for a while, and I know that the scene has changed dramatically. But um, what is your in what's your take now? You know, of the LA scene today. Well, I think the LA scene is alive and well. I mean, the whiskey's booked every night. What can you say? Uh, they just redid the Roxy. That's still open. Uh, it's doing bands every night. You know. Rainville still happening. One of my favorite places. Rainville is the first place I ever went to. Moved here in November of 1975. Went to the Rainbow. I was there every night till now, really. I'm still going. <laughs> Hi, I'm Betsy from the band Bitch. Nice. Okay. And uh, how'd you feel about the documentary? It was so cool looking, uh, watching all the people that I used to hang out with and listening to them and spin all their yarns and tell all the stories and you know I totally used to go to all those clubs they were talking about Starwood and Rodney's and Gazzari's we played our first gig with with Dante Fox which was Great White mm -hmm. it went on to be Great White at the Troubadour um, you know those are all my those are all my buddies and pals and it was just awesome just great to very entertaining uh, 90 minutes that's awesome now speaking of uh, you know playing um, at the club that you just mentioned. What was your favorite club that you uh, would go to back in the day? Uh, the, the favorite club I would go to, unfortunately, I never... Actually, I did play there with, with one band, a band called the Box Boys, was the Starwood. Starwood was just awesome. It was just like the, there was always something going on there. It was all different little rooms like they talked about in the in the film. Uh, you know, there was the showroom and there's the, the disco and there was the bar and there was the upstairs. That was my favorite club to go to. My favorite club to play, um, probably the country club. Um, Valley West, mm -hmm. you know, those are really, I would say probably the country club that had the best stage, yeah. biggest stage. Okay, great. And now, um, let's say the Starwood, do you think there's any clubs out there today that compare to the Starwood? No, and I always maintain that if the Starwood was open today, that place would just be so happening. There's, there was never a club like that before it, and there, pro and there hasn't been one since. So. Um, I, I grew up a lot in the uh, in the LA area, uh -huh. and seeing a lot of the names and hearing a lot of the people talk and tell about the history, especially with the Starwood. Growing up, I knew that was a place to go and see the bands, go and see the guitar players, and it was great to see it back up there. It brought back a lot of names and memories, and it was really cool to see a lot of the people here actually talking about it. And like, you can come out here and shake their hand. It's, it's really That's awesome. true. Yeah, yeah. That's so true. Bob did a really good job of putting it together, man. It's awesome. It's That's great to be part of it. Definitely good. I'm glad. I'm glad you have you're here. Here too, to, and you're here to, to see and re, you know have everything to refresh your memory as well. Um, so, the LA scene obviously has changed dramatically, right? Um, kind of tell me like what you know you think has changed and why. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with audience. I think a lot of the social media sites have changed everything and the way the bands are marketing themselves and the way that um, the bands put out their music now and how, how people see it. I think it's, it's, it's segregated it a lot, but at the same time I think that it gives you the opportunity to connect with who your fans really are rather than just somebody who's going to go and watch you and just sit in the seat. You're going to have people who are banging their head and you know, you know, you can share that wealth with other bands who, who are in the, in the business with you, you know? Definitely, definitely. The metal will never die, come on. No, we all know that. It might that. go down a little bit, but it never is going to die. No, I agree with you. It'll turn purple. Stop <laughs> breathing. <laughs> Whatever, still breathing. The heart beats strong. Awesome. So, and also, one more question. Um, did you guys, um, do you think that this flick is going to help inspire kids these days to kind of, you know, respect the scene that took place back in the day. Do you think this will kind of, you know, pull them in a little bit? And can only hope so. Definitely. I wasn't even born when these guys were at their height, and now I'm singing with them, and they're. It's just awesome. It's great. Uh, I grew up in Northern California, and then you hear it about some of these bands, like Arlacar and Smile, and especially Snow. And it's good to see these guys and uh, tell how their story told. It's really kind of cool. Um, like I said, you know, coming from Northern Cal, we knew Y and T, but we didn't know, we didn't get that all that good LA stuff until Metallica moved up. Um, it's great to be here to see the premiere, mm -hmm. and it's an amazing movie. I mean, some of the footage and some of the scenes and just the information that I mean, some of the stories that I heard were pretty intense. Was there anything new that you learned about today? 
I would say for certain, um, you know, some of the, some of the folks that that were actually in the film, you know, I've had the opportunity to play with, like Kelly Garney. I actually uh, auditioned for a number of different bands back in the '80s, and there was a lady who um, is pretty well known in LA and the surrounding areas back in the '80s. Her name is Lucy Forbes. So back in the '80s, you know, Lucy took me to this one audition, and, and Legs Diamond was one of them, which was in the movie. But actually, we went to play with Kelly Garney, so that was pretty cool. And I remember, you know, he was an interesting character, and just you know, getting to see him in, in, interviewed in the film was really cool. And the story about him and Randy Rhodes and him pulling out the gun and firing it in his living room—I mean, that's, you know, you know, you don't usually hear people talk like that, and that's really cool to be, you know, the honesty and just having that kind of candid interview. I thought it was really interesting, um, you know, hearing about Lars because, I mean, I used to do a lot of shows with Lars back in the 80s, early 80s, and I remember he used to have all the tennis tape on his drumsticks, you know, green tennis tape, and he talked a lot about his experience, you know, coming from tennis. I didn't know he lived in Newport Beach, so I guess his uh, family must have had some some ducats to be able to afford to live there and go to a, a nice school. but. <laughs> But it's an interesting story about Metallica, just that aspect of it. Right. And also, I thought a really cool story was um, when Joey Vera was talking about Tommy Lee and, the, and his relationship with Tommy Lee and how he was there during the initial meeting with uh, Nikki Six. So I thought that was really, you know, key stuff that I don't know if it's really been covered in a, in a film, so to speak. I'm sure it's out there in the press and the media, but really interesting stuff. This is Bernie Kay, um, formerly the lead singer of Sound Barrier. Uh, we, were, we were part of the documentary tonight. Right. And Bob has been a friend of mine like forever. So it's really cool to see it happen, you know, because it's a history that some of it I didn't even know myself. But, you know, we were like the first all black rock band, so we kind of came on the scene and tripped everybody out, you know. And uh, Bob was around to help us do that. So it was nice to see the history, like I said, and then uh, just to, you know, really give it up to the crowd because a lot of people don't know, you know. Right, right. So did you, uh, what you, you mentioned you learned a couple things. So what was the thing that you learned about? Well, wow, how all the other bands were connected. I mean, they came from one band to the next, and, uh, you know, I didn't know that because we came on the scene in 80, 81, and all those bands were already hanging out in 77 or whatever. So it's kind of cool, you know. Um, it's going to be good for all the bands to be kind of uh, maybe uh, get back out there and their name, you know, name recognition, you know. But it's, it's real cool. And what are you up to, to uh, these days? Like, what are you doing? Uh, I have a brand doing? new band called Nation that I'm working with uh, uh, an Italian gu guitar player named Alex Mossi. And uh, we're doing a video right now. We just did about 10 song EP. Uh, you know, and from this thing right here, it looks like I might get a reissue of some earlier music too, so. Tell me about the film. <laughs> Wait. Great. <laughs> no, it's very enjoyable. Yeah? No, because, yeah, I saw the whole thing. It's because, like, uh, I was kind of like a child of the Strip. You know, I was uh, born and raised. I mean, from New York, but then I was in the, uh, the Sunset Strip. Rain Rainbow, Roxy. I was very, very good friends with Bill Gazzari. We were best friends. And I'm friends now with Mike and Mario and the guys at the Rainbow. And, uh... A lot of people don't realize a lot of the money that went into the Rainbow, the Roxy, the Whiskey, came from all the Cheech and Chong films and Rocky Horror Picture Show, because Lou Adler was a partner also. And then they had these guys had the three clubs, you know, and Bill Gazzari had his, which then became uh, Billboard Live. Now it's called uh, One Oak. It's Jay Z's got it, but it was all rock and roll back then. That's where it all got started. Well, um, now tell when you me, rock and roll, you get pretty girls like this. Yeah. Everyone knows that, you know. Yeah. One of the fringe benefits. See me. Girls might do because there's a paycheck. If you're a rock star, they want to do it. <laughs> I used a great line on Barbara Walters. She interviewed me and Gene Simmons two weeks apart because of our books and documentaries. And, and they, we had the same number. And they go, how many girls? We said, eh, three to 4,000. I said, well, yeah, but that's Gene Simmons. He gets girls that look like Shannon Tweed, his gorgeous playboy playmate wife. When I'm not making movies, I get girls that look like Gene Simmons. <laughs> Did you learn anything new watching the film at all? Yeah, or? yeah they give history. The, you're learning things about the bands that you never knew. That he played with that band first, then he took them over to this group and that group. I never knew that that Mars really, you know, was that in this, was that important to Motley Crue. I mean, like you figured certain people are expendable. Then you learn that half of them created the band. You know, you know, Nikki Six was the main writer. So he gets the majority of the publishing, makes probably the majority of the money. Everyone thinking it's Vince Neil or Tommy Lee, and actually the big money maker is uh, Nikki Six. 
It's just things that, you know you never really knew. And it's interesting. It's not going to change my life knowing it, but it's interesting. It certainly is curious because it's a very important part of pop culture. And pop culture is very, very big, you know? Now, can you give me a quick review on how you felt about the documentary? I loved it. It was really accurate, and it was like reliving my, my youth when I was just dumb and innocent. It's did it take you back in time? Did oh, it make yeah. you feel like you were there again? Yeah, it really did, and it, it brought back a lot of memories I hadn't even, you know, you don't think about for 30 years or whatever, and it's just, you know, the country club, you know, all the places we used to go and all the bands we used to see, and then all the stuff. It was great. Well, speaking of uh, clubs and stuff like that, uh, what was your favorite club back then? Oh, gosh. Uh, Starwood and Country Club, probably. And yeah. the whiskey. It's, it's more because of the, the bands that played there more than anything. So. What were your favorite bands back then? Uh, Metallica, Exciter, Van Halen, uh, uh, Dante Fox, definitely because of Don Costa. <laughs> such a such a crazy man. I love Don Costa. I thought it was outstanding. You were in the flick. Yes. What was it like working with Bob? I love Bob and I love Carl and um, it's great working with them. And it's a great precursor to them doing a sound barrier documentary we're going to do after this. this way. Actually, thank you guys. Sorry about that. So it's going to be really cool, you know. Mm -hmm. This was the, the the roots planted for that, you know. Cuz we got a lot to say, we got a story to tell and we're getting ready to tell it. Right. Isn't that so? Yes. <laughs> I want to introduce everyone first. Uh, you guys probably know Carl and Joe Floyd, my co producers oh! here. Carl Rogers, Joe Floyd, and the master editor right here, Robert Gallo. Oh. Our other editor, Curtis, and Don Vito is out on the road with Snoo. So that's why we had to cut this in a little short. It's a little test. We want to get this test screening out to you for you guys to see it for all the friends and people that were involved in this movie. It is a long movie, I'm telling you right now. So uh, we're going to do like a 15-minute intermission. In between the two parts, we decided just to run it as the DVD. So um, it runs... Blu-ray. Nearly about... <laughs> Did you want to say something, Carl? Yeah, with everybody's respect and everybody's turnout, and very, uh, we're very humbled by everybody's appreciation. And we just like you to enjoy it. It's an academic kind of thing, but yet it's an entertaining and fun You'll, you'll get a great laugh out of it. There's a lot of great people, great stories, and yeah, that's all I really need to say. Um, you know, I want to thank all the bands because they helped out. They really helped out. Everybody involved, all the photographers, everybody contributed their time for free. All the bands, nobody got paid for interviews. All the photographers contributed their photographs for free. And, uh, you know, I got to thank, uh, you know, all the great photographers, you know, like Kevin Estrada, Ron Sobel, who's here today. Uh, Bill Hale, right here from Florida, from Hawaii, from out here. And, uh, you know, all, all the uh, artists, you, you guys know who you are that contributed to this and, and made this really special. Really, really I would different. have to say, let's get the show on the road. Let's do it. So. Otherwise, I'll grab my phone. Here. So let's do it. The pioneers of Los Angeles are Rock and Roll. Thank <laughs> you.